Um, this is going to be quite a long one uh, today, so what I'll do is I'll do it in two parts, uh, unless I'm uh, really quick at going through it, but probably be over two parts. Um, can everyone just confirm that you can hear me? Okay, so if you can just give me a, a number one, something like that, um, and then I'll proceed. So I'll just wait to see that uh, the sound is okay. Um, and there may be a bit of a lag, but I haven't seen any uh, response yet. So, yeah, okay, brilliant. So, without further ado, let's let's get into it. Now, uh, I sometimes have uh, problems here with uh, trying to see powerpoints when i need them and this is seems to be no exception let's just see if this if this works uh, okay so just gonna wait till yeah it seems to be working excellent all right now sorry about all the the faffing around here right the crooks gimata or Gimata, depending on how you pronounce it, um, is a supposed jeweled monumental cross in Jerusalem. So an example of a reference to it in Wikipedia is a large jeweled cross is recorded as decorating the presumed site of the crucifixion. Um, the theme today is really just asking the question, is this true? Um, I'm of two minds, I not 100% either way. Um, I, I've seen evidence for, I've seen evidence against. Couldn't couldn't nail it down one way or the other. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to present you with the evidence and you can debate it among yourselves and um, until we get something more decisive. It's really hard to say. Um, one of the problems is, for example, if we use the coins as evidence, sometimes coins can use crosses on steps to be symbolic. It may not necessarily be a reference to an actual monumental cross in situ um that's the problem uh, it would be great if we found um, a direct irrefutable piece of evidence but it seems like it's kind of a contradictory uh highly <laughs> highly infuriating sometimes when you get that but it's also intriguing and uh, which kind of led me down a rabbit hole so no further ado let's look at it a bit more now we start by this coin that we have seen on many occasions. And the question is, why this odd shape in place of the cross? And uh, we're looking particularly at the kind of what looks like a circle on a pole. Um, now, we're going to look at, you know, different possibilities here. Um, some has have been mentioned to me. Um, for example, there are orthodox crosses with a similar shape, so that could be the case, or maybe it's something else. So we're going to examine that. Um, one suggestion is, is this an expression of min, uh, monophysite sympathies, or miaphysite? Um, I'm more leaning towards miaphysite as a, a description for it, but you often see it still referred to as monophysites in a lot of uh, texts. The fierce Christological disputes of the period saw the monophysites who rejected the human nature of Christ objecting to the depiction of his body on the cross, and this influenced the use of the empty cross, especially in Byzantine-controlled areas such as Ravenna, where several of the emperors had monophysite sympathies. So is this a kind of um, expression of that, or is it just um, another form of the cross that is used by quite a sizable number of Christians? That's the question, I suppose. Now, <clears throat> from Wikipedia, uh, that the, the the page of Wikipedia that I kind of referenced at the very beginning, um, the it says the use of large jeweled crosses as processional and military crosses stems from the victory of Constantine over his rival Maxentius at the Battle of Milvian Bridge outside Rome in three twelve A.D. In there, so hope hope you can. Can all hear me okay? 
For much of the period, a large jewel cross is recorded as decorating the presumed site of the crucifixion around which the Church of the Holy Sepulchre had been built. It was presented by the Eastern Emperor Theodosius II, who reigned from 408 to 450. The Empress Helena, mother of Constantine, in the early 4th century, allegedly discovered part of the true cross at a time when interest in the cross was increasing, in part due to its use as a standard by the Roman army under Constantine, her son. Now, I just assume that this part here is a given the, the section which says it was presented by the Eastern Emperor Theodosius. But what I found when when uh, looking into it, there's actually scholars who dispute this, um, and obviously there's some that support it. So it's it's kind of a, a bit of a head scratcher. Uh, which is it? Okay, so it's in relation to Golgotha, um, and here's a, an image. Um, it's Golgotha, as you know, it refers to, or it, it means the place of the skull. Um, and if you look at that picture there, it kind of looks a bit like a skull. Uh, presumably, they haven't changed that site too much over the centuries, thankfully. Um, so f- we're going to start with the case in favour of Theodosius II giving a cross to Jerusalem. And then we'll look at the argument against that. Um, I see uh, some of you have said uh, lost the stream. Buffering, is that you or me? It might be from my end. Um, I wonder what you might have missed there. I did see buffering on the screen. Um, I hope hope it's back. Um, Let's have a look. Seems the buffering has stopped. Um, I don't think you've you've missed um, too much. Um, I think we're, this part here is the, the real meat and bones, so um, let's hope. Let's hope the uh, the signal is good. So th- we'll look at the case in favour of Theodosius giving it across to Jerusalem. Now, in in favour of this is a paper by uh, Heba Gayad, the cross above steps on the Byzantine coins. Uh, this is from twenty eighteen. Okay, uh, it's very interesting. It's a very short paper. It's free as far as I remember on um academia.edu so you can you can have a look at it it's not too long um so um it says that a new feature on gold coinage of Tiberius II uh, 578 to 82 so 6 late 6th century from Constant- Constantinople was the use of the cross as the sole reverse type on all denominations as does this solidus on the reverse cross potent on four steps Okay, and its increasing popularity reflected the progressive Christianizing of imperial iconography, in which symbols such as the cross replaced earlier pagan elements like winged victories. Now, the potent cross is that kind of, uh, you know, if you go out the limbs of the cross, there's kind of like a an extra bit at the end. That's that's referred to as the potent cross. You can see there there are. Uh, three, four steps underneath the cross. Uh, it varies quite a bit, as we'll see. All right. Now, uh, it go, the paper goes on to say the cross and steps introduced by Tiberius II, forming the main uh, solidus type of the seventh century, uh, uh, solidi of Heraclius, six ten to six forty one at Constantinople, had as a consistent reverse type of the cross on steps linked to a variety of 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 verses as this solidus of Heraclius with his two sons on the reverse a cross potent on three steps so you notice there's three steps there and here there's four steps now the inconsistency um, could mean that actually the number of steps doesn't actually matter or it could be that you know there's some symbolic meaning behind the behind all of this uh, uh hello to red wolf uh red wolf says mel i love how you always follow the evidence well i try anyway <laughs> and this is a proper rabbit hole um so goes uh let me see have i i think i've, I've just read that bit haven't i uh this bit yeah here we go uh, a new silver hexagram first coined in 615 
had an obverse seated figures of Heraclius and Heraclius Constantine. The reverse had a cross on a globe set on steps, inscribed Deus Adiuta Romanus, O God, help the Romans, may have a reference to the capture of Jerusalem and the removal of the Holy Cross in 614. No doubt that's that's what that was all about. Okay. Um, I'm curious about that globe under the cross because we don't see that in the earlier coins. Um, is there a significance there on that bit? And the paper goes on. The solidus of the emperor uh, Justinianus II, that's late 7th century, with the first image of Christ on Byzantine coins, later became a standard image on the reverse crowned figure of Justinian II facing, holding cross potent on two steps in his right hand you see it's now down to two steps so it's really strange why it's two steps three steps four steps you know what what is the the meaning behind that is it just arbitrary and then we have much later again uh, theophilus uh, ninth century the last imperial proponent of of iconoclasm linking his portrait on the front of this coin with a potent visual symbol of Christ as Solidus of Theophilus. Okay. Uh, the patriarchal cross above three steps that appears on the reverse. All right. So we can see that the, the number of steps keeps changing. All right. Now, um, cross potent, emphasizing that it is first seen on coins of Tiberius II, this identification is supported by the writings of John of Ephesus, a contemporary of the emperor Tiberius. He said that Tiberius had a cross struck upon the reverse of his coins, and this act, as he himself said, was dictated to him in a vision. There is, however, a different opinion as to whether or not this cross depicts a specific monument. In all previous examples, whether depicting the cross potent or the patriarchal cross, the crosses are elevated on one or two or three steps or the four steps. This type of cross on steps known as Calvary cross, and this is a Latin cross with a representation of three steps beneath it. Um, so it's interesting that th this type of cross is referred to as a Calvary cross, which potentially is a link to Jerusalem. Maybe that the focus at that time was all on Jerusalem, hence why they, they made their coins that way. Maybe it's particularly focused uh, um, on Golgotha. Now, um, I think the the writer meant to say these steps, but in any case, these steps have various interpretations. It may teach us that the religion of the cross is re reared upon a triple foundation, the triple foundation of faith, hope, and charity. The lower step, which rests firmly upon the earth, and which is the largest, is charity. For we are told in scripture that it is the greatest of the Christian virtues. The middle step is hope, and the upper is faith, in which the cross is firmly embedded. Um, the paper goes on to say that the inspiration of the cross shown on the coins of Tiberius II and of his successors, and on the hexagonal glass bottles, certainly is drawn from Jerusalem. As the chalice, which is shown there in the picture, from Palestine, 6th century. Um, um, it's kind of a bit funny the way it just, um, it doesn't complete the sentence there, but in any case, on one face of the vessel is a cross, is a cross stands with, in a curtained gabled ciborium at the top of steps. This paper is, is poorly written. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, typos. It could have been, uh, uh, fixed up a bit better but in any case approaching it from either side are angels with books in their arms it was a product of palestinian atelier it has been suggested by elburn and barag that the cross beneath the cyborium ultimately reflects a monumental gemmed cross erected by theodosius ii on golgotha pilgrims accounts note that the cross was protected by a roof and that it is stood at the top of stepped stepped base so we can see here the steps again uh, there's a cross at the top and it seems to be indicating that this 
this cross was uh, roofed and so forth. Okay. So it seems like there's a monumental cross there if we can take um, all of that on face value. Um, it's certainly a you know a reasonable deduction. Um, looking at your comments here, um, I see Trinity says hello, Mal Gibson, <laughs> and Vilnius says, "Oh yes, Trinity, it's the beard." <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now uh, the paper goes on to say the Golgotha cross decorated also the apse of the chapel of Adam in the church of the Anastasius. The mosaic was probably made during the restoration works in the 7th century. In the mosaic, the cross on a stepped uh, podium flanked by angels as appearing on the reconstruction of it in the figure there. Now, if we look at that one and compare it to this one, you can see that there seems to be like figures of angels um, on either side. So there seems to be a little bit of similarity, but maybe not a huge amount. Okay. And we see there are three steps. And I think there we see one, two, three, four, five, potentially five, possibly six steps. All right. So a bit of variation, as you can see, uh, in, in terms of steps. Okay. Um, now, at this point, you might be thinking, oh, okay, that's uh, that case closed. Looks like there was a monumental dueled cross, uh, except <laughs> there is a case against assuming there was a monumental cross in Jerusalem. And uh, I I got this paper from Christine Milner. Um, and thank you to my Patreon supporters. Due to you, I was able to afford to, to get access to this one. Um, she wrote a paper, Lignum Vitae, or Crux Gemata, the cross of Golgotha in the early Byzantine period. Now, um, uh, Christine Milner's bias is she believes that the relic of the cross of Jesus was a forgery, so we kind of have to t take that uh, as it stands. Um, she's, I would, I would take it, she's probably not a believer, so um, now, Disregarding that doesn't uh, invalidate the rest of her argument either way. Um, but um, obviously, I, I believe that the, the cross that they, they had was the real thing for, uh, in particular, because of the miraculous uh, events surrounding it. But in any case, we'll put that aside. Uh, she says the relic of the wood of the cross, the invention of which dates from Constantine's time or shortly after. So she's you know, the word invention there. Uh, However, despite not offering evidence of a forgery apart from the cross's rediscovery during the time of Constantine, this forms a central assumption of her paper. Nonetheless, a monumental cross, a crux gemata, a bejeweled cross, is the main focus of interest. Okay. Now, um, so she says, during the very last years of Cyril's life, two women from Western Europe made separate pilgrimages to Jerusalem Egeria, who probably came in the early 380s, wrote her own account of her journey and the pilgrimage of Paula, who came to live in the Holy Land in 385, is recounted by Jerome, who accompanied her around the holy sites. Jerome describes how Paula fell down and worshipped before the cross as if she could see the Lord hanging out, an act of extreme devotion that seems more appropriate to the actual wood of the cross than to a monument, although it has been interpreted by some as evidence for the latter. I think that's a fair, fair point. So it could be that she's actually um, uh, thrown herself down in front of the real cross, the true cross, rather than uh, just a monumental one. In the part of her journal which deals with the Jerusalem festivals, Egeria frequently uses the phrases at the cross, before the cross, and behind the cross, employing this particular cross as a kind of landmark to denote where certain ceremonies took place at the Holy Sepulchre site. For example, when describing the preparations for the veneration of the cross on Good Friday, Agiria says, uh, there it is in Latin. I have it in English here for us. And so the bishop's seat was placed in Golgotha behind the cross, which now stands, resides the bishop in the chair. Okay. Now, she... She goes on to say the more precise definition, K stat nunc, which stands there now, 
may be intended to distinguish this cross from the wood of the cross which at this point she is about to discuss and which does not stand but is kept in a reliquary and then taken out and laid on a table. Geria does not describe the appearance of the standing cross, at least not in the part of her journal which survives, nor is it absolutely clear whether her phrase case that nunc indicates a fixed permanent cross or a temporary ceremonial one, like the bishop's movable throne. The latter possibility is certainly quite plausible. The text can mean which is now standing or which is now in place, so it may refer to a processional cross now fixed into a socket for a ceremony which is about to take place at or near the, the rock. Indeed, Egeria indicates in another part of her account that many elaborate liturgical furnishings and decorations were brought out for special festivals. No doubt many of these gold and jeweled liturgical artefacts which so impressed her were identical with those gifts of the Emperor Constantine recorded although not exactly described by Eusebius half a century earlier. In this sense, the cross which Aguirre noted at the Golgotha rock, and others apparently did not, could well have been a donation of the Emperor Constantine, but this has to remain a conjecture for which no evidence has yet been found. Okay. So the question, I suppose, is was this cross given by Constantine or Theodosius the second? So you see, see the issue there. It's, there's a question of is is this originally from Constantine or is it from Theodosius? So the paper goes on to say, in marked contrast, the other cross to which he frequently refers as the landmark is always simply crooks, and there is no indication in the text that this cross has any significance other than denoting where ceremonies take place or where buildings are in relation to it. Some scholars who are wary of assigning a Constantine origin to the supposed memorial cross in Golgotha nevertheless claim that Theodosius II erected a dual cross on the rock in the early 5th century. The main textual basis for such an assertion is Theophanes Chronicle, written in the early 9th century. This records that in AM 5920, that is AD 427, the Emperor Theodosius II, in exchange for relics of St. Stephen from Jerusalem, said a gold cross studded with precious stones to be fixed at or on the rock of Golgotha. Theophany's story may well be a medieval fabrication because no contemporary source records uh, sorry, because no contemporary source records any such donation by the Emperor. Two later historians, George Kedrinos and Nicky Foros Callistos, etc., also relate the same story, virtually quoting Theophanes verbatim, but there is no record of it prior to the ninth century. That's a bit of a red flag there. So we kind of, you know, it's, we have to be consistent, you know, as much as we can. That if if there's no early reference to something, and then it suddenly is referred to two or three centuries later, we kind of have to be uh, wary that it's not apocryphal. All right. So the paper goes on to say, but the historical accuracy of the rest of the story is very rarely questioned. As a consequence, it is sometimes assumed that a Geria's landmark cross of the 380s must have been a plain one, as it apparently needed replacing just a few decades later by something grander. Um. Now, Hullum, whose main interest in this part of Theophany's account concerns the transfer of relics of St. Stephen to Constantinople, cites in support of the story an encomium of St. Stephen, probably delivered by the patriarch Proclus in Constantinople within a decade or two of 421, which appears to confirm at least the translation of relics of Stephen to Constantinople although even this point has been strongly challenged by John Wortley. This almost contemporary encomium does not, however, make any reference to a dual cross being sent to Jerusalem in exchange. So that detail of Theophanes' story may well be apocryphal, even if the rest is true. The huge gold and jeweled cross of St. Pudenziana apse mosaic in Rome has been claimed by some scholars to be a depiction of this imperial cross, but 
as the latest date for completion of the mosaic is 617 and the earliest possible date for the Theodosian cross is 420, there's quite clearly a problem of timing. The question of conflicting dates seems to be ignored by many scholars, a notable exception being Dan Barag, who, while stating that the cross in the mosaic is apparently identical with that of Theodosius, also admits that a later date would need to be assigned to the uh, St. Pudenziana mosaic. The problem here is that the mosaic would then have to post-date its own integral dedicatory inscription. So there's dedicatory inscription on this mosaic in Rome, which kind of throws a spanner in the works. So it's a bit of a mess, isn't it? So this is the uh, mosaic, okay? And so we can see clearly there's a, a gold and bejeweled cross, and it seems to be on a raised platform. It's not clear that there are steps underneath it, but you could potentially view it that way. Um, the problem is that this could be just a symbolic uh, depiction of the cross on the hill of Golgotha, and, and there's nothing more to it than that. Um, so let's see what else is said about it. The St. Pudenziana apse mosaic originally included a dedicatory inscription on its lower edge, dating the decoration of the church to the time of Pope Innocent I, 402 to 417. So obviously it can't have been done after 417 because the Pope was no longer alive. All right. The paper goes on to say, before the 9th century, the only textual indication of gold and jewels in association with a cross at Golgotha is found in the various anonymous pilgrim guidebook dating probably from the early 6th century. All right. Um, so that could be, you know, potentially a piece of evidence in favour of it. Now, it goes on to say that the Breviarius is a hybrid text with many additions and some apparent contradictions. The additions were probably annotations made by pilgrims who had used it as a guidebook, but it may originally have been a sort of advertising broadsheet for pilgrimages to the Holy Land. In its description of the Golgotha buildings and the relics associated with them, the Breviarius makes two separate references to the cross. Of these, the first lines 6 to 10 is quite clearly uh, to the relic of the wood of the cross, but the second lines 38 45 is usually taken to be a description of a monumental gold and bejeweled cross on the rock of Golgotha. So if we go back there, this breviarius, at least the second half, appears to confirm that there's a monumental cross in Golgotha. Okay, but is that the case? These lines describe what can be seen at the hill of Golgotha, including the cross of the Lord adorned with gold and gems. But a close reading of the few extant versions of the text indicates that this second reference must also be to the wood of the cross housed in its elaborate reliquary and not to a memorial cross. Okay. Now, firstly, it should be noted that on both occasions, the cross in question is referred to as Crux Domini, uh, which would be the cross of the Lord, which was one of the customary titles of the wood of the cross. This fact alone surely indicates that both references are to the same cross. Uh, yeah, that seems logical. But the most convincing argument in favour of the second cross being not a monument but the relic is the fact that the cross adorned with gold and gems is identical with the cross which brought a dead man back to life. This is a reference to a well-known legend, well, according to Herzl's legend, in circulation at least as early as the, the year 403, which recounted the first miracle performed by the relic of the wood of the cross. It was also the miracle as the Breverius explicitly states here, which identified this particular piece of wood as the real thing. So without that miracle, they wouldn't have known that this is the wood of the cross. It's a kind of an important part of this story, but she dismisses that, and that's fine. The Breverius's first mention of the cross refers to uh, cubiculus ubi crux domini posita est. And the second refers to a place either at or on the rock of Golgotha, ubi fuit Crux Domini Exposita. Apologies for my absolute torturing the language here. 
the use of uh, exposita instead of posita could indicate some kind of public display of the relic, probably under uh, a balcony, although one version of the text says under open sky. Uh, I think that word is baldachin, sorry. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, in the near contemporary text of Theodosius, it is recorded that during the Feast of the Holy Cross, which is in se September, the relic was, let me just go to that for a second. Um, maybe that part wasn't important. Sorry, I'll leave that bit out. So just ignore that last bit. Um, those Latin bits, um, uh, room where the Lord's cross is placed, and the second one is where the Lord's cross was exposed. In the near contemporary text of Theodosius, um, it is recorded that during the Feast of the Holy Cross, which was in September, the relic was displayed for seven days, which is, suggests that by this date, over a century later than the visit of Egeria, who does, however, note the existence of the festival, there was more frequent public access to Jerusalem's holiest relic, and that on some occasions it may have been displayed as distinct from being venerated. One further deta detail in which the Breviaris differs from Agirius' late 4th century account is that the 6th century document describes the cross as being adorned with gold and gems, whereas Agiria reported that the reliquary was of gilded silver. Agiria may simply not have noticed the jewels, but it is quite likely that a new, more elaborate reliquary had been made sometime in the 5th century to house the wood of the cross. From the second half of the 5th century, it became increasingly common for reliquaries of the cross to be made of gold and jewels, and often cruciform. For example, in two of the papal arteries in Rome, one made in the 460s for Pope Hilary, Catherine Baptistry, and another for Pope uh, Symmachus at St. Peter's Baptistry around the year 500, which is almost exactly contemporary with the Bravarius. Later in the 6th century, an elaborate reliquary, uh, uh, it's unfortunately, there's, it's a discontinued bit there. Uh, let me just, we'll just go, go from there. So apologies. Um, later in the 6th century, an elaborate reliquary of the True Cross was sent to Rome as a gift from Justin II and his wife, Sophia. This originally had its fragment of the cross surrounded by a circle of 12 precious stones. The Jerusalem relic may also, by the early 6th century, have been housed or displayed in some kind of shrine because the Bravarius mentions silver doors and a screen adorned with gold and silver. This is in addition to the canopy, which of course could have been made of silk. All right, it's quite a lot to take in. Um, but the, it's basically an argument about is the reference to... Uh, a gold and bejeweled cross could it be that it's actually there's a bit of confusion that it's actually the reliquary itself which is gold and bejeweled and the cross is just the um well the true cross rather than a monumental cross right so we'll, we'll continue a little bit a little bit longer maybe another 20 minutes and uh then we'll we'll continue continue this in part two um at a later stage in a few days time Alongside these apparent differences, however, the Bravarius records one striking parallel with the ritual of Garius Day. She had reported that immediately after venerating the wood of the cross and in the same small chapel just behind the, the rock, pilgrims also kiss the ring of Solomon and the horn of anointing. These two important relics made direct reference to the Jewish temple and were agents in the Christian's ritual transfer of temple space to the Golgotha site. Significantly, the Bravarius also locates these two particular relics in the same place at the Crux Domini, although by this date another relic had been added, the plate which had once carried the head of John the Baptist. Okay, so there's a few additional uh, features there which I I found quite interesting that there, I didn't hear of these i certainly didn't hear the the horn of anointing the ring of solomon i may have heard of that one before um so I decided to go down a, another rabbit hole <laughs> so we're just taking a little diversion here for for a minute um and this diversion was actually quite fruitful okay so 
Um, if the whole point of what we've, what we've been looking at doesn't seem particularly relevant to you, you know, doesn't seem like a big deal. Is there, is this particular cross a monumental one um, or not? And you know, it might might throw up some significance in terms of the the coins later. But um, but there's a reference to Solomon's ring as a kind of a ritual that the pilgrims uh, attended in Jerusalem. Um, so this is a little bit more information about it. It's often depicted in the shape of either a pentagram or a hexagram. Um, the earliest references to Solomon's seal or signet stem from within Jewish traditions. It's first mentioned by the first century Jewish historian Josephus and is similarly referenced by the third century Jewish magical text Sefer HaRazim and an Agadio section of the tra tractate given within the Babylonian Talmud as well. In parallel, a first century Greek manual of Judo Judeo-Christian magic known as Testament of Solomon also makes reference to the seal of Solomon. Now you can see on the right there a silver coin minted uh, in three sorry 1351 AD in Turkey. It includes an inscription in the Uyghur script that reads Sultan uh, Adil. Okay. So it's it obviously had a, a the concept of Solomon's seal or Solomon's ring obviously had a big uh, following and interest for the people at the time, probably because of the Kabbalistic element of all of this. Something that, the, as you can see, the Islam seems to have um, imbibed quite a bit, but it was originally a very strongly Jewish uh, thing. So that's interesting, isn't it? When we think about um, has Islam drawn a lot of its ideas from Judaism, this is, is another example. The tradition of Solomon's seal later made its way into Islamic Arab sources as Gershom uh, Sholem, the founder of the modern academic study of Kabbalah, attests, it is difficult to say for how long certain definite names have been used for several of the most common seals. The Arabs made many such terms especially popular, but just the names Seal of Solomon and Shield of David which are often used interchangeably for the two emblems, go back to pre-Islamic Jewish magic. They did not originate among the, among the Arabs, who incidentally know only the designation Seal of Solomon. Okay, so we can, we can trace a dotted line, as it were, from um, Judaism to Islam here with, with this artifact. Okay. Um, now, let's just go on from there. I don't think there's anything else that, on that that we need to concern ourselves. Um, so it's often, uh, I think we've mentioned that, in the religious lore, the ring is variously described as having given Solomon the power to command the supernatural, including Shadim and Jen, and also the ability to speak with animals. Due to the proverbial wisdom of Solomon, it came to be seen as an amulet or talisman or symbol or character in medieval magic and renaissance magic occultism and alchemy so we can, we've we've covered how much that um judaism was interested in that but also islam um and there's a strong parallel in that interest in magic and all that kind of stuff now um in relation to command the jinn Okay, let me just go back a second there. Um, so you see here that um, the ring is variously described as having given Solomon the power to command the supernatural, including the jinn. Okay. Now, if we look at uh, Surah 34, 12, um, we know that the jinn, well, we assume that the jinn is actually a reference to uh, the Geonim, the leaders of the Jewish academies. Okay. Now it says, and to Solomon we subjected the wind, its morning stride was a month's journey, and so was its evening stride. And we caused a stream of molten copper to flow for him, and we subjected some of the jinn to work under him by his Lord's will. Okay, now that could indicate, it's talking about um, making these Jewish leaders work under Solomon. So that would suggest not Solomon from centuries ago, but actually a contemporary Solomon. Okay, Suleiman, and whoever of them 
deviated from our command, we made them taste the torment of the blaze. Now, Suleiman is an 8th century caliph. So, can you see the, the problem? <laughs> this is Surah 34, 12, and if it's referring to a contemporary caliph from the early 8th century, this would date the text to that time or later. That's a problem. And Gnosis says, we subjected the wind. Okay. Um, what's Solomon subjected the wind? We have Suleiman ibn Abdul al-Malik, 675, that's when he was born, to 717. He was the seventh Umayyad caliph, ruling from 715 until his death. His commander, Umar ibn Hubayra al-Fazari, launched a naval campaign against the Byzantines in 716 AD. Now that would actually, creating a, a navy um, and launching it against the, the Byzantines would actually fit in very nicely with We Subjected the Wind. Um, and the reference to a month's journey could either could easily indicate a journey to Constantinople uh, through, you know, over the sea. Okay. Now, um, so we have here uh, already from early 716, the Arab commander, Umar, had launched a parallel naval campaign against Constantinople. While many troops were dispatched toward the Byzantine capital, Suleiman appointed his son Dawood to lead a summer campaign against the Byzantine frontier in 717. Okay, Suleiman's efforts ultimately failed. The Byzantines repulsed the Umayyad fleet from Constantinople in the summer of 717. Okay, um, so I think that could be a contemporary reference. So I think this is pretty huge. All right. What about this reference to the ability to speak with animals? Okay. In Islam, Sol Suleiman, or Solomon is regarded as one of the prophets of God who was bestowed with many divine gifts, including the ability to speak to both animals and jinn. He is also said to have enslaved the uh, shayatin, the devils, with the support of a staff or ring given to him by God. Okay. Now, um, introducing another paper here, primary evidence in the Quran. Uh, it's a recent paper by A.J. Juice. I did, never got around to um, uh, covering it yet, so this is my opportunity to at least uh, reference part of it, a very interesting part of it. Um, it refers to verses 15 to 54, and he gives a summary of what happens in this. Switching to Solomon, who can understand the language of animals, it presents a story about a march to the Valley of Ants, its conquest and submission of a female queen ant and her followers who originated in Saba. Those from Saba had turned away from the way and appeared to worship the sun. Okay. Now, this is very much coded. Um, it's coded because it's following the Jewish uh, Talmudic approach of, you know, you don't say everything literally out. You kind of hide things in coded language that um, certain people can get what the references are to. So A.J. Juice uh, argues that Surah 27 has a contemporary meaning related to the Caliph Suleiman. Let's decode Surah 27, 15, 17. So uh, here are the bits, the bits that are of interest. Indeed, we granted knowledge to David and Solomon. Do you remember um, we had a reference to Solomon and David, right? Suleiman and his son Dawood, which is David. Okay, you see that? Indeed, we granted knowledge to David and Solomon. So you have Caleb Suleiman and his son David, right? And they said in acknowledgement, all praise is for Allah who has, a priv who has privileged us over many of his faithful servants. And David was succeeded by Solomon. Now, this is where it follows the biblical um, the story. That's part of the the um, the attempt to confuse the reader so that they don't get that it's actually really talking about David and Solomon. I know that's a bit of a, might seem like a bit of a stretch, um, but it's as we'll see, it's it's uh, very cleverly coded and, and the story twisted so that you don't get what's been really referred to. 
David was succeeded by Solomon, who said, O people, we have been taught the language of birds and been given everything we need. This is indeed a great privilege. Solomon's forces of jinn, humans and birds were rallied for him, perfectly organized. So we have a human being here who uh, has the forces of humans, okay, but also jinn and birds. How is that? Does that sound... If we take that literally, it doesn't make sense, okay, unless you, you just accept all this, this silly tale. But what if it's um, not what we think it is? Um, let me just make sure we got the right one here. Okay, so gen humans and birds, let's try and decode that. Solomon's knowledge about birds and the organization of ant colonies is composed from a familiar biblical framework. Solomon is the overlord of some of the leaders of the gen. Remember? the uh, Geo name, and men of the Jinn, as well as a group of Altairi, that is phonetically related to birds but are not birds. The Jinn are straightforward. These are the subjects of the Geo name in the Babylonian Pharisee academies. Okay, In short, Jinn could simply be substituted with Pharisee, but more precisely with Pharisee Geo name. The men submit to the Nasi here, the Pharisee prince. So you have um, got two Jewish groups, essentially. You have the, the Jen and the men who are the ones who submit to the Nasi. Okay. The Altari, okay, yeah, at the top, you could it'll make it even clearer, is a reference to the Tayaye. Right. The Altari appears to be an allied group that is akin to raptorial birds, vultures, perhaps ravens, or simpler crows. It is a Talmud-style wordplay, likely on Tayi, the Jewish tribal alliance that has settled between the Ghassanids and the Nestorian Lachmids, vassals of Persia, in the north-central area of the Arab Peninsula. We can perhaps best compare the usage of Altari in Surah 105, where birds in flocks, Tehran, uh, Abbe, sorry, Ababila were sent against the army of the elephant or biblical reductionists, the companions of the boastful. Embedded Ambilia means that God had sent Babylonians, not birds, in flocks. The question is which Babylonians the Tehran were, likely the Tayi. The authors of the Quran were having some fun with an unwanted audience. The territory of the Tayi included Medina and Kebar. Given a larger-than-life presence, one could view Hatim Altay's ruling successors as crows. For example, Hatim means black crow. Okay, so that's how AJ Juice um, decodes that text. Okay, so if we read that again, um, we can see that indeed we granted knowledge to David. Now, I, I've taken another uh, approach to this that perhaps... David may not have been uh, a reference to um, Solomon's or Suleiman's son David, but maybe that David in this context could be Abdul al Malik. If that's the case, then later on in the next part, and David was succeeded by Solomon, makes an, a lot more sense. So Abdul al Malik is the David, as it were, not the literal David who is Suleiman's son. And then S Solomon is Suleiman, okay? Um, now, the language of birds would be Arabic because it's the language of the Tayaye, okay? And then Solomon's forces of jinn, which is the adherents or followers of the Geonim. Humans are the subjects of the Nasi, and the birds are the Tayaye. So you have Solomon's or Suleiman's forces are united to all of these groups, the, the Jewish group uh, connected with Babylon, okay? the the Nasi, okay, and their and his followers um, who eventually set up in southern France, and you also have the the Tayaye. I hope that makes sense. It's quite a, a lot to take in, but I find this absolutely fascinating. The implications of this are absolutely huge. It 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 would if we accept the logic of all of this, it would prove that there's at least part of the Quran which was written in the early eighth century. Um, and not in the 7th century. So that's pretty important stuff, you know. Okay. 
So back to Solomon's ring. In religious lore, the ring is variously described as having given Solomon the power to command the supernatural, including Shadim and Jinn, and also the ability to speak with, with animals. If there was a ring of Solomon that was an object of veneration, all of these ideas are likely built upon a mistaken understanding of the Quran's coded message that related to events in the early 8th century under Suleiman's reign. All right. Um, so if we, after all of that, if we return to the whole question of uh, the monumental cross, we kind of went off on a bit of a tangent there. Um, now we're back to the, the question of uh, the monumental cross. We, we saw that the pilgrims venerated uh, Solomon's ring and the um, what was it called the um, the horn of anointing okay so if it goes the paper goes on to say if all the available evidence from Reverius is adduced then despite some apparent confusion between the manuscript versions the wording of this passage indicates beyond any reasonable doubt that the cross described here is on both occasions the relic of the wood of the cross and so to interpret the second reference as a description of a monumental cross or as a support for Theophany's story would be to misread the text. No other surviving pilgrim account from Gary's time until the Persian invasion of Jerusalem in 614 refers to any kind of memorial cross on the rock, even though most of them describe the rock itself. Thus, for example, the P Pianzina pilgrim who went to Jerusalem around the year 570 climbed the rock by means of the steps cut into it so there you have the steps uh, which he believed to be the same steps christ had climbed to his crucifixion on top of the rock he saw a blood stain and near this the altar of abraham but apparently no standing cross let alone a gold and bejeweled one what did impress him greatly however was the relic of the wood of the cross venerated in the ceremony he describes in detail that seems to be pretty good evidence that there was no monumental cross certainly in 570. Other pilgrim accounts before 614 also indicate that this relic was as sacred to pilgrims as the tomb itself. So for various lines 6 to 10, okay, that's in Latin. In English it says, at the entrance of the basilica to the left is the room, is the room where the Lord's cross is placed. The room where the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ was placed. Okay, so that's clearly the true wood of the cross rather than a monumental cross. And then the second part, which was the one that some people um, assumed must be a monumental cross, it says, it has silver doors where the Lord's cross was exposed, all decorated with gold and gems. The sky above is open and there is the living room where he was resurrected through whom the cross of Christ was revealed, and itself the cross is of gold and jewels, and the sky above is golden. Okay, um, now it's a bit unclear there, because it does seem to indicate that there that you have a monumental cross indicated because of the gold and jewels, okay. But the paper goes on to say, if then there was a, mon a memorial cross on top of the rock, it apparently did not mean much in comparison to the real thing, which could be seen and kissed. And this must, of course, be taken into account in the present investigation. In other words, the fact that no memorial cross is described does not necessarily mean that one did not exist. On the other hand, if such a cross did exist, but was not significant enough for pilgrims or theologians to describe, it seems unlikely that this same cross would have been depicted in the center of a church apse or on pilgrim souvenirs. The cross depicted here would surely have been the true cross that is the relic. Okay, I think that's that seems a quite a strong argument. Now, I have to say, though, um, that bottom part there does still feel like it could be uh, uh, a monumental cross. Um, but the visual evidence needs to be treated with even greater caution because it is easy to produce a circular argument or a non sequitur. For example, that if a mosaic depicts a huge monumental jeweled cross on the rock of Golgotha, such a cross must in fact have existed there. The strongest counter to such a simplistic identification 
is the wide variation in type amongst images of the cross on the hill. For example, those on the late 6th century pilgrim ambulae from Palestine, which differ markedly even among themselves, which are never, at least in extant examples, shown as being jewelled. While some scholars see no problem in identifying the ambulae crosses with an actual monument on Kolkata, others are more cautious. Andrew Graber, for instance, even though he believes that the, the St. Pudenziana cross represents a jeweled monument set up by Theodosius II on the Golgotha rock, is unwilling to accept that the ambulae also depicts this and argues that they depict instead the relic of the true cross. As evidence, he cites the inclusion of the four rivers of paradise, which in most of the ambulae images flow down the rock of Golgotha from the foot of the cross, indicating clearly that this is a symbolic and not a topographical representation. Gary Vikan has also suggested, like Grabber, that the two kneeling figures of pilgrims which occur on many of these ambulae on either side of the cross indicate that the cross depicted here is the relic. I would say would further suggest that even the cross of the St. Pudenziana apse mosaic is also a primary image of the prototype, the true cross, here dressed in the appropriate gold and, and jeweled uniform of its new Jerusalem setting, just as in the same mosaic, Christ's heavily thrown is also gold and jeweled. The iconography of this apse should not be interpreted too literally, however tempting this may be, because even though architectural forms recognisable as 4th century churches at the Jerusalem holy sites are employed as background images. The four beasts of the apocalypse in the sky above indicate that something other than contemporary Jerusalem is pictured here. While most scholars would agree on this last point, many still take the view that because some actual buildings appear to be represented in the background, the cross on the hill must also be a representation of an existing monument on the Golgotha rock. <coughs> so, um, <clears throat> I'm going to come back to you. Um, let me unshare that there. Okay, so, we're going to stop it there. That's that's part one. We'll come back uh, to this at a, in a few days' time because I don't want to get, uh, make this video way too long. Um, leave your thoughts below. There's a lot to, to consider. I do think uh, AJ Juice's uh, contribution here to um, an argument that the Quran is from the 8th century is uh, hugely important. And it, I... <clears throat> I think that uh, a lot of this evidence kind of crosses over each other and kind of leads to interesting finds. So that's it for today. Thanks a lot for dropping by. See you all very soon. Bye-bye.